Thank you, Linda. Well, we all have been enriched by Dennis's deep mathematics and his charismatic approach to life and his generosity. And in my case, the story is the same, only more so. <laughs> so in 1984, I was a problem graduate student going into his last year with no thesis and no thesis advisor. And I was lecturing to whoever would listen, which was Bob Devaney and a couple of other graduate students, on some great, exciting preprints on complex dynamics that Bill Goldman had brought back from a trip to France. Um, and finally, Mumford sent me to New York to meet Dennis. And after a couple of trips, he invited me to study with him in France. And uh, this was a transformative experience mostly taking place in the IETS lunchroom, where each day Dennis would challenge me with a new proof of density of hyperbolicity, which I think he had <laughs> constructed while driving to the IETS for lunch that day. Uh, but even better, becoming part of his extended family on Boulevard Jardin changed my appreciation for the richness of life. And a few months later, I had an advisor, and then a little later I had a thesis, and for that, and everything that followed leading up to today. I'd like to thank Dennis. <laughs> so I, I as I said, I first got to know Dennis through his mathematical writing, which is gripping and sublime, like a good detective novel by Raymond Chandler. Um, it also shares with a good mystery the property that if you put it down in the middle and come back a few days later, you have to start again at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the most, uh, the papers that's had the biggest impact on my own mathematical career is Dennis's paper which introduced the dictionary. So of course, I don't need to describe this to the present audience. I'll just show you a page from it. We close with a sample of the dictionary between analytic iteration and discrete subgroups of PSL2C. And uh, this has just been, this is something Dennis already, I think, was beginning to appreciate in the late 70s. And uh, it really uh, was a watershed in the mathematical developments here. Um, and uh, there's a lot that can be done. Let me just show you a couple of pictures. I spent a lot of time trying to construct Sierpinski carpets in both uh, Kleinian groups and as limit sets of Kleinian groups as rational maps, there's the whole renormalization theory, which has many different manifestations. Um, and uh, the other great thing about the dictionary is that if you're working on the dictionary, you can pretend you're not really an expert in either language. <laughs> you're just working on translation. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I checked, and I, I've written one book and 12 papers so far on the dictionaries. Here's some of the attempts at translation that have appeared in those papers. But I have to say that none of them capture the um, kind of excitement I remember in looking at just the first couple of pages of Dennis's paper uh, with this limit set, uh, this, this Julia set, and this quasi-Fuchsian limit set. Although when preparing this talk, I was struck by the fact that this quadratic Julia set is not quite symmetric under z goes to minus z. It has a little. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of computer drawn, but it could also, it's not quite clear where it came from. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about some, um, some work in, in uh, two dynamics in two complex variables today. But before I leave this subject, I just want to mention one other uh, contribution of Dennis's that's been mentioned but not completely um, appreciated which is this idea of bow bounds. So, so bow has, there's two great things about the expression bow. So first, what it stands for is bounded and eventually universally bounded. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember clearly when Dennis and I were driving to the he was going to give a talk at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and he said, I've been thinking about what the bounds depend on, and they don't depend on anything. 
And that's what's captured in this abbreviation. But the other great thing about this abbreviation is that it encodes the needing sequence for the second bifurcation on the way to the Feigenbaum point. So if you forget <laughs> how the critical point should be deployed on the real axis, you just put one here, and then this is its order four. Okay, so let's go on to, um, to my topic for today. So I actually have one or two more comments just on all these papers I've written on the dictionary. One is that there's a, there's a great paper by um, Peter Jones, Carlson, and Yokos called on Julia and John. And I, most of my papers on the dictionary are about trying to do things in rational math that had already been done in Kleinian groups. And this is one of the few that goes the other direction. And I was trying to come up with a title for it that would be as good as Julia and John. But somehow Klein and John just didn't sound right. <laughs> so anyway, I published it under some innocuous title. But secretly, it's called What You Get If You Pass to the First Name which is Felix and Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, um, yeah, that's, the, uh, that's my comment on my contribution to the dictionary. Okay, oh, one more comment. So I have to say what was so exciting about this paper, which is that, as you all know now, Dennis had proved a few years earlier this spectacular result on no invariant line fields for um, finitely generated Kleinian groups. There's no measurable invariant family of lines on the limit set. And my fondest dream when I read this paper was to generalize that theorem to the case of rational math. And this is still, I think, my, my Jugendtraum, although I think maybe it's more my Alterstraum now. <laughs> but um, I think that's still a great problem and it's still one of the most exciting ideas in this area is to somehow figure out how this beautiful proof for limit sets works for rational maps. Okay, so let me turn to another problem that I don't know the solution to, which is a problem that will sound initially like it's a number theory, but it actually has a dynamical flavor. So the problem is, what is the smallest integer bigger than one? Okay, so yeah, what do I mean by integer? So what I mean by integer is an, is an algebraic integer. That is, it's a solution to a polynomial equation with integer coefficients that, that's monic. And what I mean by smallest is that the Mahler measure of this integer is as small as possible. Now, what's the Mahler measure? Well, if you have a polynomial of the type I just described, it will have finitely many roots. These are the, not just lambda, but all the conjugates of lambda. And what you do is you take the conjugates that lie outside of the unit circle, we presume that there's at least one, and you form their product. And that's called the Mahler measure of this algebraic integer. And it's unknown what the smallest algebraic integer is in this sense. However, there's a guess. And the guess is the degree 10 algebraic integer. It's shown here. So while this is the real positive real root, of this degree 10 equation, and all the other roots are shown uh, in this picture. So this polynomial has 10 roots, but it has exactly one root that's outside of the unit circle. And it's a reciprocal polynomial. That is, 1 over lambda is a root of the same polynomial, as you can see, because the coefficients are a palindrome. And, uh, and the rest of the roots lie on the unit circle. This is an example of what's called a Salem number, an algebraic number with this shape for its conjugates is a slow number, and it's in the number itself, this positive, this real number bigger than one is the Mahler measure, because there's only one root to, uh, in, to be involved in the product. And conjecturally, this is not just the smallest slow number, but it's the smallest possible Mahler measure for an algebraic entity. Okay, now, for if you fix the degree of an algebraic integer, then you know how many terms can possibly enter the Mahler measure. And if you bound the size of the Mahler measure, then you bound the positions of all of the roots of the polynomial. Therefore, you bound the coefficients, which are integers. So there's only finitely many polynomials of a given degree with a given bound on their Mahler measure. And because of that, it's possible to find the smallest uh, uh, 
smaller measure for each degree, and it's also possible to find the smallest Fallot number for each degree. So uh, these uh, smallest numbers are known for a large range, uh, up to about degree 40. And here are some of the numbers. So lambda 2 is just the square of the golden mean. So 2.618 is 1 plus the usual golden mean. Lambda 4 is a little bit smaller, and then they get smaller, smaller. And then here's Lamer's number. This is the smallest. And then they start to fluctuate around a little bit. And nobody has ever been able to find a select number or an algebraic integer that beats a Lamer's number in this sense. Well, that raises the question, what is Lamer's number? So, um, well, it's a number that has many manifestations. So let me tell you one of the manifestations. So it's associated to this Coxer diagram. Now, what is this, this picture? First, this is a picture of an object that's going to play an important role in this talk. It's a picture of a lattice. Now, what's a lattice? A lattice is, you can think of it as a discrete subset of, um, of R to the N with the Euclidean metric with the property that the inner product between any two vectors is an integer. And so to describe such an object, I just have to tell you, if you take a basis for the lattice, what are the inner products between any pairs of elements? And this picture has one red dot for each basis element. And those basis elements each have inner product with themselves equal to 2. And then almost all the other inner products are 0. That is, most pairs of vectors are orthogonal to each other. But when they're joined by an edge, the inner product is minus 1. So this is just a convenient way to write down a symmetric 10 by 10 integer matrix. It has twos down the diagonal, and it has some one, minus ones scattered on the off diagonal corresponding to the edges that you see in this picture. Now, what's so, why, why did I have this strange normalization that some of the vectors have length, squared length 2? It's because if you have a vector of squared length 2, then reflection in that vector sends the lattice to itself. See, it's not a priori obvious that a reflection is going to preserve the integer points in this lattice, but it does. Um, th so these are what are called, uh, this is called a basis of roots for the lattice. And each of these red dots gives a, a little bit of geometry. It gives an element, a generator of a reflection group. And that reflection group is called the Coxeter group for this, for this diagram. So associated to this picture is a lattice in 10 dimensional space and a group of isometries of this lattice, or maps that preserve the inner product. Now, whenever you have a Coxeter diagram like this, there's a, there's a central element of this group. Sorry, I don't mean central in the technical sense. There's an important element in this group which sort of tells you what the whole group is doing. And that element is obtained by forming the product of all of these reflections. Take every reflection just once, multiply them together. This gives what's called the Coxter element in the group. And it turns out that in this case, the characteristic polynomial of the Coxter element is Lamer's polynomial. So here is a sort of succinct way to say where Lamer's polynomial is coming from. Um, and in a, well, now almost 10 years ago, I proved that Lamer's. Uh, conjecture holds for the eigenvalues that arise from elements of Coxeter groups. That is, if the only algebraic integers you knew how to make were those that arise as eigenvalues of elements in reflection groups, then within that restricted setting, Lamer's conjecture is true. Um, now, you might wonder, by the way, how can you have this uh, element of infinite order uh, acting on this, uh, this lattice, E10, by isometries. I mean, after all, Lamer's number is bigger than 1. If you had, for example, the E8 diagram, which would be obtained by lopping off two of these vertices, you'd get a famous sphere packing in uh, eight-dimensional space, and you'd get a finite isometry of it, in fact, of order 30. So what's happening with Lamer's number? What's happening is that this lattice has signature 1-9. That is, or 9, 1, the way I've normalized it. That is, it's an indefinite lattice. And in fact, it corresponds to a canonical nine-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. And on this canonical manifold, this product of all nine reflections represents the shortest geodesic. 
So this very small picture is a succinct way to say what Lamer's number is, and it carries into the background a nine-dimensional hyperbolic manifold, arithmetic, and the length of the shortest geodesic is log of this small solemnum. Um, okay, so let me, for the, since there's so many topologists here, let me give you another picture of what Lamer's number is. So take a surface of genus five and draw on it a configuration of simple closed curves that's based on the same diagram. And make these into two colors, red and blue. Then take products of gain twists once around each of these curves, always in the same direction, say right gain twist. This is an instance of a famous construction due to Thurston. You'll get a pseudo Anosov map of this surface to itself. And it turns out that the entropy of that pseudo Anosov map is the logarithm of Lamer's number. So this is beginning to hint that there's a connection between algebraic integers, Coxeter groups, entropy in this whole picture, and that, that's what's going to be the main subject of my, of my talk. Okay, so let me say a few words about entropy. I'm, I think almost everyone here is an expert on entropy, but this will be fast. <laughs> so if you look at the number of books that, can, that are written in English, with n letters, the number of possible books is not 26 to the n. That's because if you choose the letters at random, it, what comes out is nonsense rather than English. So English has a, a lot of restrictions on what letters can follow other letters for it to make sense. And in fact, the entropy of English is about log three. That is, as you're reading along, there's on average about three choices for the next letter. And so that's what entropy is. Entropy is a measurement of the growth rate of patterns. And when you have a dynamical system, a map of a compact topological space to itself, you just break it up into pieces. You look at all the possible orbits and the infinite words they can generate, and you see the number of different patterns of length n you have. And the rate at which the orbit patterns grows is, turns out to be asymptotic to some number lambda to the n. And this number lambda, or rather its logarithm, is a measure of the complexity of the dynamics. Okay, now here's how, uh, here's an example. Um, so if you take the torus in n-dimensional space, so Rn modulo the standard Zn lattice, then any uh, matrix, invertible matrix in GLNZ gives a dynamical system. It gives an automorphism of this torus. For example, when n is two, we have the famous two, one, 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 a Nosov map. Well, it turns out that for a linear map, the entropy is just the log of the product of the eigenvalues of this matrix, which are larger than one. In fact, that's another way of saying it's the log of the spectral radius of the action of F on the cohomology of this torus. If you have k eigenvalues outside the circle, then the action on HK has spectral radius equal to the product of the absolute values of those eigenvalues. So in fact, Lamer's conjecture is equivalent to the statement that for linear torus maps, the entropy is either zero or it's bounded uniformly away from zero by the log of Lamer's number. Now, uh, I, I haven't been able to make any progress on Lamer's problem, but I, I made uh, an analysis in this very restricted setting of Coxer groups, but all these entropy uh, discussions suggests that there might be an other restricted settings in which we could try to determine what's going on. So my main topic for today is the entropy of automorphisms of complex surfaces. So here's the setting. X is going to be a smooth projective surface over the complex numbers. So it's a compact, complex manifold of dimension two or dimension four over the real numbers. And we have an algebraic or uh, or um, holomorphic automorphism of this manifold. So this is not the theory of rational maps because the degree of this map is going to be one. And my question is, what small values can the entropy assume in this setting? So first, yeah, yeah, I'll have lots of examples. <laughs> so the first, uh, the first thing I want to remark on is that why am I starting with surfaces? It's because of what happens in the case of, of, of uh, curves, that is the case of one complex dimensional manifolds. Um, so let's think about the classification of Riemann surfaces. So the Riemann sphere has lots of automorphisms. 
but they're not very complicated, right? The most uh, hyperbolic transformation pushes everything on the sphere from one fixed point towards the another. So they turn, those all have entropy zero. On a torus, you can have this 2, 1, 1 map, but it's not holomorphic. If you try to make a degree one map of a torus to itself, well, it's a translation coupled with some finite order rotation. So again, it's, it has entropy zero. In fact, it's an isometry for the flat metric on the torus. So that forces it to have entropy zero. And similarly, in higher genus, the automorphisms are isometries for the hyperbolic metric. So they have finite order, and they certainly have entropy zero. So the really, surfaces is the first case where we can see something interesting in this setting. And it's because a map on a surface doesn't have to be conformal. It can contract in some directions and expand in the complementary complex direction. OK, so before I get to the examples, um, I want to mention the relationship between this discussion and Salon numbers. So here's a, a theorem. And this is, you could almost take this as the definition of entropy in this setting. It's a theorem uh, that involves uh, a conjecture of Mike Shoup, who unfortunately left, but left me his name tag for lunch. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a theorem. So Mike Shoup conjectured that in general, if you have a diffeomorphism of a manifold, that the entropy of this map, the topological entropy, is bounded below by the leading eigenvalue of one cohomology. This is called the spectral radius. So here, a star of x without additional notation will mean the complex cohomology. Um, the spectral radius is just the size of the largest eigenvalue for that linear map. And, uh, and remarkably, this is a theorem uh, by, by Gromov using the, the proof of Shub's entropy conjecture by Yamgen. That for an automorphism of an algebraic variety over C, the entropy is, in fact, computed by the action, the linear action on cohomology. This is always a lower bound by Young, and in fact, it's, it's correct on the nose for algebraic varieties. For an example you know well is that if you have a rational map of degree D on P1, then its topological entropy is log D. Now, why is this true? This is a miracle. <laughs> what it says is that a uh, algebraic automorphism is the simplest possible dynamical system it can be given what it does up to homotopy. So its action on cohomology is just is invariant under isotoping the map around. And this map is as simple as possible. Why is it as simple as possible? It's possible because. It's as simple as possible because of the main result of Taylor geometry, which is that a subvariety of projective space, an algebraic subvariety, is a minimal surface for the natural metric on projective space. And in the same way, the graph of f is a minimal surface in the product of x with itself. But incredibly, as you iterate the map, the composition of this minimal surface with itself remains a minimal surface. And so it's always trying to represent the uh, cohomology class in the product as efficiently as possible. And that's the basis of, of Gromov's proof. OK, so what happens for surfaces? Well, for projective surfaces, which will be what we discussed today, it turns out that because of this theorem, the entropy is always the logarithm of a solemnum. And in fact, it's achieved by the action on, uh, on the middle dimensional cohomology, H2 of x. So let me, let me explain why this is true and start drawing a picture of the cohomology of a surface. So um, let's see, maybe I can get away with one or two boards. So, so I'm going to suppose now that, that x is a complex surface throughout, and f will be our automorphism of this surface. Now, the second cohomology of x over c, well, it has a lot of structure. So for one thing, it has a Hodge decomposition. That is, it's h20 plus h02 plus h11. <coughs> and sitting inside of this complex space is the integral cohomology. Let me just call that l. And L is a very beautiful object because there's an intersection form. If you have 
Two curves on a surface, you can count the number of points where they intersect. More generally, if you have two two cycles in a four manifold that's oriented, as a complex manifold is, you can count the number of intersections. So there's a pairing, an intersection pairing here, a dot b, taking values in z. And this pairing is unimodular. That is, it gives an isomorphism between L and its dual, um, L into Z. So this is, this is because of Poincare duality, and it's a critical property of this lattice. Um, OK, so what else? Well, this geometric intersection pairing has a simple expression in terms of differential forms. Namely, if we go to H2 of XC, then it's the same as it's a its complexification gives the Hermitian inner product, which is I over 2, the integral of alpha with beta bar, as alpha and beta are, say, complex valued two forms on the surface. And what's going on in this Hodge decomposition? Well, the these this this part of the cohomology H20 is represented by holomorphic two forms on the surface. That is, it's represented by objects that locally look like eta of z, dz1, dz2, where eta is holomorphic. And when you take such an object and uh, wedge it with itself, of course you get zero. But if you wedge it with its complex conjugate, then you get a volume form on the surface. So this is like the absolute value of eta squared. Anyway, it's positive. And in fact, this, so the signature of this inner product on the H2002 part is P0, where P is the dimension of, uh, of H20. It's a positive uh, definite space. Now, what about uh, H11? Well, here there's a beautiful theorem called the Hodge index theorem that says the signature here is 1Q. That is, there's one positive direction and there's Q negative directions. And what does this what does this mean geometrically? Well, we're talking about a projective variety. If you have a projective variety in projective space and you cut it with a hyperplane, you get a curve. And this curve has positive <coughs> self-intersection, which is namely the degree of the curve. That accounts for this plus one here in the intersection form. And if you cut it with two different hyperplanes or two different hypersurfaces, they have positive intersection. And then it turns out that because of that, all the rest, all anything that's linearly independent from this uh, from this hyperplane section must have negative self-intersection nodes. So we have good control on the signature of the two pieces of the space. And then the beautiful thing is that if we have an automorphism of our surface, it induces a map of this lattice to itself. So it acts here. It induces a map of the second cohomology to itself. And that map has to preserve all of this structure. So our mapping F is in the orthogonal group for, for the intersection form on these two spaces. It preserves this product structure. So it's in the orthogonal group for the positive definite inner product of dimension P cross the orthogonal group 1Q. So it's almost in a product of two orthogonal groups, which would be a compact group. If it were in a compact group, then all of its eigenvalues would have to be on the circle. But because of this one here, it's allowed to have one eigenvalue off the circle, then the reciprocal must also be uh, an eigenvalue. OK, so that shows the eigenvalues are deployed in the same way as the lem numbers eigenvalues are. And then, of course, the eigenvalues are algebraic integers because the matrix describing its automorphism can be written with integer coefficients because it preserves this lattice L here. OK, so in the setting of surfaces, the upshot is that the entropy is an example of one of these Selen numbers. OK, now, the theory of surfaces is pretty complicated, but it's not that complicated. Roughly speaking, it follows the same pattern as the classification of Riemann surfaces. There's things that are sort of like the projective plane, and then there's things that are sort of like surfaces of higher genus. And then there are things in between, which are sort of like elliptic curves. <coughs> and it turns out that the vast majority of surfaces are the so-called surfaces of general type, which are like 
uh, Riemann surfaces of higher genus, and those have finite automorphism groups. They tend to have canonical metrics on them, um, like a Taylor-Einstein metric or something like that that generalize the hyperbolic metric. Once you have such a metric, any automorphism must be an isometry, and then it has zero entropy. So the only surfaces that can have automorphisms of positive entropy have to be metrics that don't have canonical <coughs> metrics on them. And it turns out, by a theorem of Cantat, that up to a small nuance, which is this word birational here, the only possible examples of surfaces with automorphisms of positive entropy are a complex torus, so that, that's just a generalization of an elliptic curve or to higher dimensions. Um, well, not quite the projective plane. The projective plane has, like P1, it only has a linear group of automorphisms, they all have zero entropy, but it turns out something interesting can happen if you blow up many points on the projective plane. So that's, we're then, then exploiting this word birational here. So there's surfaces obtained by blowing up a certain number of points on the projective plane. And then finally, there's an object which has no analog uh, in the theory of Riemann surfaces, which is a K3 surface. And that I'm gonna spend um, the bulk of my discussion on this case of K3 surfaces, but I'm gonna touch on the other two um, examples. But in any case, there's sort of three different arenas in which we can ask the question of what's the minimum possible entropy of an automorphism. Now, there's a little more structure I should uh, mention. Let me not use the um, blackboard yet again. Um, but here's the question I want to address. What is the minimum positive value of entropy possible for automorphisms of each type of object here? And remember that the entropy has to be the logarithm of a selenium. So certainly if you believe Lamer's conjecture, a lower bound is the logarithm of Lamer's number. So here's the answer, which was only achieved a few weeks ago. The, the minimum value is in fact the minimum that is consistent with Lamer's conjecture. So let me explain what that means. It turns out that for a complex torus, a projective automorphism has entropy log of a selenium number of degree at most four. So it can't possibly get up to Lamer's number. The smallest it could be is the logarithm of the smallest selenium number of degree four. And in fact, that's what happens. For a K3 surface, the degree could get up to 22, but we already know that Lamer is the best possible for degree less than 40. So the minimum con consistent with Lamer's conjecture is uh, what it would be the log of Lamer's number. With a projective plane, it's a little more complicated. In principle, when you blow up enough points, the degree of the entropy could be arbitrarily large uh, over Q. Um, but nevertheless, we can establish the theorem even though we don't know Lamer's conjecture. So the answer is, it's the log of lambda four in the case of a complex torus, and it's the log of Lamer's number in the other two cases. And for the experts, I should mention that one can also say Enrique surface, that's something that's double covered by a K3 surface, so it's essentially contained in this case. Okay, so that's what I want to, want to describe today is a <coughs> sketch, uh, the discussion which underlies this theorem, the classification of possible minimal entropies in the case of projective surfaces. Okay, now I want to compare this uh, just in sort of a free associating way to a great theorem of Sullivan's from 1971, which uh, I'll phrase slightly informally here. What, what Dennis proved is that the mapping class group of a simply connected compact manifold is an arithmetic group. So that means you take the diffeomorphisms of X to itself, just as you would for a surface to form the mapping class group. You mod out by those which can be deformed to the identity, and that group, which you know, for, the, for, the, for the mapping class group of a surface is not even, uh, it, it's, it's quite far from being a, in any obvious way a linear group, that is literally an arithmetic group. That is a, <coughs> essentially the, up to finite index, the integral points of a, of a Q algebraic group. That, so that means it has a very concrete description up to a sort of finite order nuance. 
And that's quite a, a fantastic result. What it, encap it encapsulates a very long and, and rich discussion in algebraic topology, um, which has to do with the following. I have two manifolds, or maybe a single manifold, and I have a map, a homotop equivalence of this manifold to itself. And what I'd like to do is deform this map to a diffeomorphism. If I can, then it's in the mapping class group. And you sort of fight your way towards trying to fix it up so it becomes a diffeomorphism, and you meet certain obstructions along the way, you find certain structures that have to be preserved, and at the end of the day, the condition that it becomes a diffeomorphism is encoded by this arithmetic group. Okay, so how does the entropy of surfaces discussion go? It works like this. First, we have to find lower bounds, but that's fairly easy as I sketched. That just more or less has to do with controlling algebraic integers in certain special groups. But then the hard part is to construct examples. I have to find a complex torus with a simple automorphism, one that has very low entropy. I have to find a, a, uh, a blow-up in the projective plane with small entropy, and I have to find especially an automorphism of a projective K3 surface with small entropy. And the technique for doing this is what I call synthesis. So what we're going to do is we start with just an element of number theory, so lem number, and we, try, we start to try to imagine what this dynamical system at the end of the day is going to look like if its entropy is log of the solemn number. And so the first thing to do is to try to think about what its action will be on the homology of your surface. So then we have to realize it by the automorphism of a lattice. It has to preserve our least hot structure. And once we do that, we, can, we try to invent a surface that has all of that uh, cohomological data, that hot structure, correct. And then we try to prove that this automorphism in the world of linear algebra is actually realized by a holomorphic map of that space to itself. So there's a couple of lessons here. One of the lessons is Number theory is secretly dynamic. <laughs> and I was very glad when I finally learned this because I'm now in a department where at least half of the other faculty are number theorists. And I was wondering who I was going to talk to, but I suddenly realized Dick Gross. <laughs> because although he's a number theorist, he, he realizes that number theory is the study of automorphisms or endomorphisms of, of modules. An algebraic unit is essentially like an n by n matrix. An n by n matrix is potentially the action on cohomology of a dynamical system. Okay, so let's get started. Let me do the easiest case first, the projective complex torus. So the theorem is for a projective complex torus, you can find an automorphism of entropy log lambda four. Lambda four is about 1.7, and this is optimal. So that's the smallest possible degree for solemn number. The synthesis part is rather easy in this case. Why is that? It's because we know what an automorphism of C2 mod lambda looks like. It comes from a linear map of C2 to itself. And so what we do is we first guess what action we would like on the, on the one-dimensional cohomology of this torus, which is just Z4. It's just a real four-dimensional torus. So we write down a four by four integer matrix with determinant one. Now, if this matrix has no real eigenvalues, well, it's supposed to have four eigenvalues, so these eigenvalues must come in two complex pairs. And what that means to say it only has complex eigenvalues is that there is a way to embed Z4 into C2 so that the action of F on this lattice becomes multiplication by a pair of complex numbers. In other words, the matrix becomes diagonalizable over C. So as long as this matrix has some simple property for its characteristic polynomial, it determines an embedding of the Z4 lattice into C2, and just by linear algebra. And then what's our complex torus? It's C2 modulo that lattice. And that's the end of the synthesis. So this case is quite easy. And the reason it's so easy is that the Hodge theory of this torus. Yeah. That's true. There's something I've swept under the rug here is that this is a projective torus. So 
That's why this happens to be degree four. If the Todd structure has to have a special shape, or if you like, there should also be a symplectic structure on this space, which is perturbed by the automorphism. Well, it's at least compatible with the automorphism. But yeah, that's a proof that uh, if you don't require projective, you just want to build a complex torus, you give me the number, and out comes the torus. Now, uh, just to give you an idea of the fact that this is all actually pretty simple in the case of a torus, here's, here's, the, here's the example. You take the, one of the most symmetric elliptic curves, namely you take the Eisenstein integers, z adjoin a cube root of unity, so the hexagonal lattice, you take the quotient of the complex plane by that lattice, and on, on this elliptic curve, you can not only multiply an element by an integer, but you can multiply it by a cube root of unity because the, of this hexagonal symmetry. And so the, the two by two matrices over the Eisenstein integers act uh, on this, the product of this elliptic curve in itself, which is a two dimensional complex torus. And here's the map. This is the map that happens to have minimal entropy. So there's really very explicit Algebra, uh, model for this map on the level of the universal cover C2. Okay, so now let's turn to rational surfaces. So let me tell you what a rational surface is. You take the projective plane, this pristine homogeneous object, and you break the symmetry by picking some points and replacing each of these points with the projectivized tangent space at that point. So a point on the projective plane suddenly becomes replaced by a curve, a copy of P1, which happens to have negative intersection nodes. And uh, this procedure of taking points and replacing them by sort of a little, a tiny infinitesimal neighborhood of them, represented by this P1, is called blowing up. So you can take P2 and blow up n points on it. And of course, there's lots of moduli to the configuration of n tuples of points on P2. So you've got lots of different, different uh, algebraic surfaces by uh, this construction. Topologically, though, all you're doing is you're taking the complex projective plane and you're taking its connect sum with n copies of its complex conjugate. So from the point of view of smooth manifolds, what you've done is very simple. You just keep putting in these CP2 bars. And what happens is on the level of H2, well, the, the, the uh, cohomology of P2 is generated by a line. So that's a a uh, one-dimensional space over z, and the intersection form is, well, a line intersect a line is one point. So the, the uh, intersection form is just a one-by-one one matrix of one on the diagonal. And when you blow up n points, all you do is you get a, a n plus one-dimensional matrix with one on the diagonal and then n minus ones on the diagonal, and otherwise equal to zero. So it's a very simple structure. It's sort of the integral Minkowski space of dimension 1n. That's the, that's the blow up of, uh, of P2 at n points. And you might think then that the automorphism group of this blow up would just be, um, would just be the, the automorphism group of this Minkowski space. But there's an additional piece of structure which I haven't mentioned here yet. There's something called the canonical class, k of x. This has to do with the fact that you can take wedge two of the uh, complex cotangent bundle to this space and look at uh, what this represents as what its uh, first term class is. It's some sort of canonical element of the two-dimensional cohomology. And for, for P2, for example, it's, it's represented by almost by a cubic curve. It's by minus one times an elliptic curve on P2. And each time you blow up, you get an additional minus one curve on your surface, which you had to add in to this canonical class. So the point is that the complex structure knows about this special element in this Minkowski space. So that element must be fixed by any automorphism. And consequently, the perf of that element with respect to the intersection form must also be invariant. And if you figure out what the, that perf is, Lo and behold, it turns out to be this beautiful EN lattice. So that's perhaps the best des description of what the EN lattice is. You take the Minkowski space, which you know very well, diagonal intersection form, you take this very simple vector, and then you take its perf, 
the vectors that are orthogonal to it, that turns out to be, have a basis with this more complicated looking intercept. Now, once we have this EM lattice with all these roots, it generates a reflection group. And what the data showed is that the automorphisms of a rational surface have to be contained in this reflection group, which is sometimes even smaller than the orthogonal transformations that preserve Kx. Um, and anyway, there's a natural element to try to look at in this reflection group, namely the Kochster element, take the product of all of these reflections. So uh, I proved that, in fact, the Kochster automorphism of this EN diagram can always be realized by an automorphism of a rational surface blown up at n carefully chosen points. And in particular, the entropy of this Coxter element becomes the entropy of this automorphism of PT. OK, so so far I, I, I've only had one very mild example. Let's make, make this a little bit more concrete. Well, so the first case where it's interesting is the case of, uh, of blowing up 10 points. When you blow up 10 points, you get the ET10 diagram, and you get a, a surface automorphism with the log of Lehner's number as its entropy. That's if you blow up fewer than 10 points, this construction just leads to an automorphism of finite order. For example, if you blow up eight points, you get an automorphism of order three, which is 30 with no entropy. Um, and in fact, this case where you blow up 10 points has the minimum positive entropy among all surface automorphisms. How is that proved in the absence of a proof of Lamer's conjecture? It's proved using Nagata's theorem, that is, Nagata's theorem tells us that for rational surfaces, we only have to think about elements in the Coxter group. This item has already been analyzed. For tori, we're also done. We haven't done the case of K3 surfaces, but we know that the degree of the algebraic numbers we can get is bounded by 22, and Lamer's conjecture is already true on up to degree mode 22. So this was really the only difficult case for getting a lower bound. So the lower bound holds, and then this example shows it's in fact sharp. Well, let me just say a word about uh, how this example is synthesized. Um, rather than doing it in, in formal math, I'll go straight to the picture. So in fact, this example was first discovered by Bedford and Kim. And by the way, throughout this conference, which has just been terrific, I've heard many people graciously mention counterexamples to conjectures I made without mentioning the conjectures. <laughs> so the Bedford and Kim gave a counterexample to yet another conjecture I had rashly made. <laughs> and uh, anyway, their example was, a, was an automorphism of, of P2 blown up at 10 points. Uh, and they, and the, they found this example by systematically studying this extremely simple family of automorphisms of, of P2. You take x and y, you replace it by y, the ratio of y over x, and then there's only one, one more thing to do. You can translate by these two numbers, a, b. And they started, they first tried to find the values of a and b such that this automorphism became periodic, and then such that it could be lifted to an automorphism of a rational surface, but potentially at infinite order. And they found this Lamer example that I, I later constructed by other means. Well, I started by scrutinizing their example very carefully because it was a counterexample to this unstated conjecture. Um, and what I found was that the 10 points they blew up, for some reason I tested whether or not they lay on a cubic curve in the plane. And the chances of that are zero. And yet, I asked Mathematica to find the cubic curve that went through these 10 points and it printed it out immediately. I said, oh my gosh, I wonder what that cubic curve looks like. And I drew it, and it turns out to be a cuspidal cubic. That is, it, like, it looks like y squared equals x cubed. And in fact, this mapping has two fixed points. One fixed point is the cusp of this cubic, and another <coughs> fixed point is this other red one that's very close to it in this particular picture. And I then realized that if you require that the points you blow up lie in a cuspidal cubic, then you can, that makes the problem rigid enough that it has a unique solution for a given element in the Coxter group. And so then I was able to construct this example by pure thought, as someone would say. And, uh, 
The, and, and here, like let me show you here, what I want to show you here is just some of the dynamics of this example. So there's very few examples in two complex variables where one can say what happened to most points on, the, on the, this four-dimensional surface. But in this example, you can. And what happens is that under iteration, over either R or C, almost every point is attracted to the cusp of this qubit. The points that are not attracted form this, this blue uh, Julia-like set uh, that's being rendered at least in the real locus in this picture. So anyway, that was a very exciting example to understand. And it also taught me a lot about the theory of rational surfaces. It's much richer than you might guess at uh, first sight. Algebraic geometers often just sort of sweep rational surfaces under the rug. Oh, they don't have any unique minimal model. Don't worry about them. They're fairly trivial. In fact, they're quite rich, dynamically speaking. OK, so we come to the last example, which is an example of the theory of K3 surfaces. Um, so I first learned uh, what a K3 surface was from, from Barry Mazur, who's a great, great at bringing things down to earth. So here's an example of, let's not worry about the definition at the moment. Here's an example. So if you're in three real variables, you take an equation like this and you look at its zero locus, that turns out to be <coughs> an example of a K3 surface. So I'll tell you in a moment what a K3 surface is, but let me tell you first why this one is so nice. So, uh, so what's, what's critical about this equation here? So you might say, well, this is an equation for a surface of degree six, because if you multiply it out, you get an you get a total exponent of six for x, y, x squared times y squared times z squared. But if you think of it as an equation in each variable individually, it's quadratic. It's quadratic in x by itself, quadratic in y by itself, and quadratic in z by itself. So what that means is that this surface has the property that if you draw a line parallel to one of the coordinate axes, then this line intersects the surface in two points namely the two roots of the corresponding quadratic equation. And that in turn means that if you fix one of the coordinate axes, there's a natural involution on this surface, which simply takes those two points of intersection and interchanges them. And by composing these involutions, you can play a sort of ping pong game on the surface. Namely, you go down and then over and then back, and then up and then over and then back. That is. You, you play this trick with respect to each of the three coordinate directions, or put it differently, we consider the automorphism obtained by the product of these three evolutions. Okay, so now let me say a word about what a K3 surface is. And since that's what will be concerning me most of the time, I'll modify this diagram. So first, a K3 surface has a trivial canonical bundle, that is, Sorry, this should have been 2p0. Anyway, the, this surface has a natural holomorphic two-form on it, which is nowhere zero. It doesn't vanish at any point, and it's holomorphic. That's part of the definition. Algebraic geometers would say the canonical class is trivial. That's one of the reasons why these surfaces can have so many automorphisms. Any automorphism has to fix the canonical class. Well, if the canonical class is trivial, that imposes no condition on the automorphism. Um, what else to say about this holomorphic one form? Well, what's our main example that we know of a surface that has a, a nowhere vanishing holomorphic one form? It's C2 modulo a lattice. On C2, the form dz1, dz2 is translation invariant. And so, of course, it descends to a two-form on the corresponding complex torus. So in this way, a K3 surface is similar to a complex torus. So what's the rest of the definition? The de rest of the definition is that the fundamental group of the surface is trivial. So it somehow is like a simply connected complex torus. It has, uh, so it has no real analog in the theory of Riemann surfaces. And its, its cohomology turns out to be, in some ways, very simple, and in other ways, very complicated. 
So let me give you an example. Let me just flesh out the picture so you can see that phenomena. First, what is this integral lattice here? Well, the way people usually write it is that for a K3 surface, L is equal to E8 plus E8 plus 3H. So what this means is there's a certain beautiful, very special 8 by 8 matrix coming from the Coxter diagram uh, with it, of the type I showed before. You, that defines a lattice, so it's a z to the 8 with, uh, with an inner product on it, unimodular. You take two copies of that, and then you take three copies of a hyperbolic plane. You have to put in the signs right. So in the first place, the rank of H2 is 22. It's a 22-dimensional space. And then that's just as an abstract abelian group. Then on top of that, it has this complicated inner product. Well, it turns out the signature of this inner product is 319. That is, it has three positive directions and 19 negative directions. And they're apportioned among the hot structure like this. The, this form eta spans H20. That's what makes this two-dimensional. It's positive definite. And then everything else is over here. So it's 119. You add those up and you get 319. But it turns out there's a much better way to think about this lattice. This lattice is, in fact, the unique, even unimodular lattice of signature 319. And one of the reasons it's so huge is that the signature of this manifold, namely 3 minus 19, which is equal to minus 16, this has to be divisible by 16 by Rockland's theorem. This is a spin manifold because of the fact that this is an even intersection form. And for it to be smooth, well, Rockland's to the smooth spin manifold, form manifold must have signature divisible by 16. So it's suddenly a lot more complicated than anything else we've looked at. On the other hand, these are the, in some ways the most primitive of algebraic surfaces. For example, I've given you a concrete equation there with an equation. If I also took a, a, a degree four hypersurface in P2, it would be a K3 surface. It would have all of this topological complexity. But the other thing I want to say about this surface is that this is the right way to think about its intersection form. This surface doesn't know where these E8s are. It doesn't know this splitting. It only knows that it's even and that it has this signature. And there is a unique lattice with the property that it's even and that it has this signature. And that's great from the standpoint of trying to realize an automorphism of a surface, because at some point, we're going to have to construct an automorphism preserving some complicated inner product. But if we can show the signature is right, it's unimodular or even, then we know that we're done. OK, so let me, let me try to wrap this up just by saying, uh, showing you a few pictures of what happens with K3 surfaces and telling you how the constructions go. Um, so one of the first things is that because of this 2, 0 form, if you have a real automorphism, it preserves the area form uh, on this K3 surface coming from this 2 form, coming from its absolute value. So here's an example of one of these major surfaces. So what I've drawn here, here's the surface itself. It's sort of shaped like a sphere, even though it has that strange equation. Well, the, the cardioids we see throughout the Mandelbrot set also have higher degrees. And what I've drawn here are some orbits of some randomly chosen points. And what you see is identical to a typical picture of an area-preserving map on the sphere. It has elliptic islands. It has island chains. It has a stochastic sea, et cetera. So it seems to represent all of the possible interesting phenomena. Um, now, I, I've recently drawn some more complicated pictures that also show the stable manifold of a fixed point here, just so you can get some idea of the richness of the dynamics. Here's an example as you deform the surface a little bit. This is something with a very simple algebraic equation. It looks like the dynamics is ergodic. I don't see any elliptic islands here, but there's no one's ever been able to verify that. And here's another example just to emphasize how strange the shape becomes as you change the coefficient. OK, so, sorry? So this is the, this is, I started with the orbit of some randomly chosen points on the real surface. 
on the real locus, right? So when the surface is real, these involutions are real, the whole thing has a real, uh, has a real slice. Um, I don't really know what happens over the complex number, um, but I'll come to a few statements about it. Are, are, the, ones, are yeah. the ones that appear ergodic, do they somehow have large entropy? They all have the, so over the complex number, they all have the same entropy. That is the same there, right? Yeah, right. right. So, so the real slice I don't really, I don't know what the entropy is on the real slice. Okay, so let me try to wrap this up by saying a few things about doing the reverse process. That is, going from a candidate for a K3 surface automorphism to something that actually has that, an actual algebraic surface that has that entropy. So, so here's a construction that Dick Gross and I made uh, quite some time ago. It takes as input a degree 227, a degree 22 Solem polynomial, and it gives as output a K3 surface, which has that as the characteristic polynomial for the action on H2. Now there's some mild restrictions, but they're very simple on this polynomial, and out comes this K3 surface and everything. How is this possible? Well, I could quote all the theorems that are used, but basically it's possible because we cheat. Now why, how do we cheat? This surface is not projective. You see, the action of the dynamics on this surface has to preserve the algebraic cycles on the surface, and they'll form a proper subset of the full cohomology <coughs> because of this H20 here, which can't possibly be spanned by algebraic cycles. And so if you have a projective surface, the degree of the automorphism over Q can be at most 20. And so when we made these examples, well, we did it using a lot of complex manifold theory, but they're not the projective surfaces that I was teaching. They have some other structure, which is neat. Namely, you can construct these so there's a Ziegel disk on the surface, even though there's positive entropy. Ogisu showed that you could blow up these examples and get a counterexample to the Kadaira conjecture, which was also proved by Claire Blazan at about the same time. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't really uh, finish the theory. Um, so in, in about 2009, I proved that there was a K3 automorphism with entropy Lamer's number, and that's best possible. But again, I cheated. <laughs> Namely, this example is also not projective. Um, so I won't go through the details of the construction, but it was done by first finding, so to speak, an algebraic model for the dynamics, and then using some complex manifold theory to prove it exists as a geometric object. Um, and at the same time, I was able to construct a projective example with entropy lambda six, uh, which, but, but then two years later, in fact, just a few weeks later, I finally found a projective example with log Lamer's number, which is, which is awesome. So what happened between 2009 and 2011? Well, here's some construction. Let me just say what happened. What happened is that I met Eric Bedford in Banff. And in the intervening years, they had gone on to study this dynamical system. X, Y, Z goes to Y, Z, and then a fractional linear transformation of X, Y, and Z. In this case, depending on just one variable. So they were studying, they said, let's go up to rational maps on P3 to itself. And they found an amazing example which preserves a pencil of <coughs> cortic surfaces on the projective plane. So I've sort of drawn it, uh, I've drawn it schematically here. It actually preserves the four coordinate planes, which is a degenerate quartic surface. It's a union of four linear surfaces. But then you can deform that quartic into a one parameter family. And all of those quartics are K3 surfaces. And the entropy on all of them is log, is log lambda eight. So sort of by looking at the first concrete example they could think of, they beat everything that I've been able to do using number theory and Hodge theory. Uh, so I was astounded and I spent a long time trying to analyze this example and I finally figured out what was going on. So let me just, just finish by saying what the new idea is. There's something I haven't told you about. On a K3 surface, there are certain cohomology classes which have to be represented by copies of, uh, by, by copies of P1, that is by rational curves on the surface. Or more properly speaking, since a rational curve has a fundamental class, these classes or their negatives must be represented by rational surfaces. And they, 
what they do is they take H11 and they cut it into a bunch of chambers. These are the perps of the Novo curve. And our automorphism is trying to do a hyperbolic transformation on the H11, which has signature 119. But it has to preserve one of these chambers. And so as you can see here, if, for example, the reflections through the chambers form a, a fi cofinite volume hyperbolic group of hyperbolic isometries, then there's no way you can have a geodesic which preserves one of these chambers. The stabilizer of a chamber is, is finite. So this, here I'm trying to make the automorphism, but there's all these so-called roots which are obstructing it. So here was my solution. <laughs> Get rid of all the roots. <laughs> but that's too, too conservative. You should allow some of the roots to stay. <laughs> And with this construction in mind, it turns out there's a little number theory twist, which must be used in Bedford's and Kim's example, and which allowed uh, one to continue to do a projective example with corresponding to language numbers. So let, let me finish by just saying something about this whole investigation, which is that uh, the study of these automorphisms of minimal entropy, like the study of dense sphere packing, like the search for minimal volume hyperbolic manifolds, orbifold cusp manifolds, none of these things are important because of their immediate, broad theoretical impact. They're interesting because they challenge us to come to grips with the full range of geometric and topological forms a given structure can represent. And uh, the reason structure is in one language is again because of Dennis Hall. I've shown, actually I showed you a couple of formulas, so uh, let's just see if I can go back. So, so it's true that my methods are, are by their nature not concrete. I, I try to guess the hot structure and, and go back to get the example. But, uh, so where's the, oh yeah. So I don't have a picture of this, but this for example is an automorphism of P3. There's a certain quartic hypersurface, which I haven't written down the equation for. The equation for the surface is very complicated, but the dynamics is you just take this map and restrict it to that hypersurface. And so it's, it's not only does it have a simple formula, but it's basically like a generalized Fibonacci sequence. Namely, the next term is just obtained by a simple function of the last three terms. You copy down y and z, and then you form some fractional linear transformation of the preceding term. And the other example I showed that was quite concrete, which of course I needed to draw the picture, is this one where you use the three involutions on the surface that has degree two in each variable individually. So all of the examples I know how to analyze algebraically actually have very simple algebraic <coughs> models. This example that I've lately constructed, I don't even know an algebraic model. So what was the reason why you Oh, what was the reason why I asked Nimble to look for this cubic curve? So this, uh, this is something that, again, I learned in the, in the process of investigating this. If you take a birational transformation of P2, like a Cremona transformation, it changes the degrees of curves, except for cubic curves. That's why cubic curves are said to represent the canonical class on P2. A birational transformation of P3 will change the degree of hypersurfaces, except for quartic hypersurfaces. They remain of the same degree. So what I was secretly looking for was a canonical curve on this object. And, and what that canonical curve does is it furnishes that surface with the holomorphic one form. And that form makes it look, even though it's a rational surface, it makes it look very similar to a K3 surface. It looks like an open K3 surface. So it almost looks like, an, like a complex torus from a, from a certain perspective. Um, and I should say that there's little doubt that this discussion of Bedford Kim extends to higher dimensions, and the next step will be columbia free manifolds that also have simple automorphisms. What's the reference for uh, uh, things which emit uh, on the metric automorphisms of blah, blah, blah? Yeah, Serge-Contact. What? Serge-Contact.
Well, let's thank the speaker again.